Okay, let's start. Today I will continue with X-ray reflectivity. This is another very important type of X-ray based experiment and it is very widely used for scientific purposes and also for industrial applications. So what is the aim of such experiments and what we get from the exp from, from X-ray reflectivity experiments? So you can consider that we have three main uh, output from such experiments. If you have a tympan or a multi-layer tympan, you can get the electron density of each layer of the material. This is very important because electron density is unique for each element, okay? Depending on the material, electron density changes. So by measuring the electron density, you can, you can determine the properties of different layers within your material. In addition to that, by using that method, layer thickness of each layer in multi-layer systems can be determined and the roughness of the surfaces and the roughness between the, uh, between the layers, I mean interface roughness, can also be determined by using that method. Let me draw here something and then you can get better idea about this. So let's consider that this is silicon substrate and here you have iron, here you have nickel, for example, here you have platinum. So um, iron has different electron density, nickel has different electron density, platinum has different electron density. You can find uh, that information in, in the periodic tables in internet, okay? So um, if they are pure iron, pure nickel and pure platinum. And if you make alloy, for example, instead of iron here, if you have iron cobalt alloy, let's say 50% iron, 50% cobalt here, okay? So this will have different electron density. And if you have, for example, here, nickel iron, let's say here we have nickel iron alloy. Let's consider that 80% nickel and 20% iron. So then you will have different electron density than the nickel. If you have 50% nickel and 50% iron, then you will have different electron density. So you can um, get such information from your material. You have an idea to produce such film and you gross it, but what about its properties? Then this method can give you that information. In addition to the electron density, this method, as I told you, can also determine the layer thickness. So you can determine the thickness of that layer, thickness of that layer, and thickness of that layer independently, okay? So this is very nice property of the material. The last one is the interface and surface roughnesses. So if you have roughness on the surface of the material, if you have roughness here at the interface, then you can also get the roughness of the interfaces, roughness of the surfaces of each layer. This is very nice, very useful, very fast method. In addition to all these advantages, this method is non-destructive. So you characterize your material and then you can use it for other purposes, okay? It is not destroyed. And with that properties, with that um, motivation, this method can measure the layer thicknesses um, from angstrom to 400 nanometers, something like this within that range. And I can tell you that you can even calibrate the thickness down to one angstrom. We have done it, okay? So if you are expert on that method, you can get the layer thicknesses down to one angstrom. So very precise, very good method. But of course, for, for, for um, lower thicknesses, 
you have to be very familiar with the uh, method and also a program you are using to calibrate your X-ray reflectivity results. And uh, from angstrom to two nanometer range, we can also determine the roughnesses of the surfaces and interfaces in such systems. Okay, so how it looks, as I told you, X-ray reflectivity measurement system um, is the exactly the measurement device for X-ray diffraction experiments. Okay, we are using the same experiment. You don't need any addition experiment, experimental setup. So if you have X-ray diffractometer, then you can carry out X-ray reflectivity experiments. Again, here we have X-ray tube. Here we have X-ray detector. This is our sample. It is staying there. Okay, this is the uh, sample angle, incident angle theta. And this is the detector angle two theta. Okay, so we are carrying out theta to theta measurement. But of course, compared to the X-ray diffraction experiments, X-ray reflectivity experiments uh, start with very low theta angles. Then you increase theta angles uh, up to 15 degrees and 20 degrees, something like this. So um, if you have any question, then let me know. Okay, so how to carry out that experiments? In case of um, X-ray reflectivity experiments, the position of the sample must be aligned before the experiment. This is, this is very important. Alignment in Turkish hizalama is very important, not only for X-ray reflectivity experiments, but it is also valid for X-ray diffraction, X-ray resonant magnetic scattering. So for many, X-ray based systems, alignment is very important. In addition to that, not only for X-rays, for many optics and optical measurements, alignment is very important. It doesn't matter you are carrying out experiment with lasers, for example, for visible light, for, for infrared, for UV light, or for X, with X-rays. So you have to align your measurement system. First of all, you have to align the sample you have to uh, find the correct position for your detector, okay? So all these things are very important. And here I will talk about sample alignment. So here we have four main steps, four or five main steps. Normally um, in, in old X-ray uh, diffractometers or in homemade X-ray diffractometers, uh, you have to carry out all the steps by yourself. But in conventional uh, X-ray diffractometers can do all this procedure by itself automatically, okay? This is, um, this new type of devices are very user friendly. But uh, here I would like to uh, show you the mechanism shortly. So here I have an animation. Uh, this is the um, detector here, okay? This yellow one is the, the x-ray detector and here we have an x-ray beam okay here we have an x-ray source x-ray uh, x-rays are produced here by using an x-ray tube okay and here we will put a sample and this is the goniometer you can manipulate the sample up and down and uh, in, in many directions so this detector is also um, mounted on a goniometer so you can also change the position of the detector so then, uh, first of all, let me start that animation and then you will see. Okay, this is our sample, this green one. This is alignment process. It has been done by the conventional X-ray diffractometers for, for many companies. It has been done automatically by the instrument. Okay, now let me try to explain step by step. So normally, depending on, on your expertise, you can carry out such alignments within 30 minutes, okay? But sometimes if your sample is very small and if you are not familiar with the instrument, it takes one hour or sometimes more, okay? If you are doing that alignment by yourself. 
But uh, as I told you in, in conventional X-ray diffractometers, this alignment process has been done by the system. So now let me, let me go into detail for each step here. So the first one, let me share a screen with you here, whiteboard. Here, first step, direct beam I0. Here we have an X-ray source. It has certain beam width. And here we have detector. Direct beam means that the whole intensity produced by the X-ray source goes to the active area of the detector. Let's consider that the detector is staying like this. If detector stays there, then you cannot see any intensity here. Or if the detector stays there, you cannot see any intensity at the detector. Right? So sometimes it is like this. We have X-ray beam and detector is staying like this. So what you see here, some part of the X-ray intensity goes to the detector active area, but some part does not. Okay. So then the position of the detector must be as exactly at the right place. Okay, so it must be like this. So whole produced X-ray intensity should enter into the active area of the detector and we should see that direct beam. Okay, so this is the direct beam. So in order to check whether the position of the detector is correct or not, we are doing two theta X, uh, scan. So what is two theta, two theta scan? Here we have two theta axis and here we have intensity. Intensity read by the detector. So let's consider that this direction is positive y and this direction is negative y and this is um, positive y direction and this is negative y direction just consider okay if you move detector in that direction so what do you see if the intensity whole intensity all x-rays goes to detector you should have huge intensity here direct beam okay then when you go up X-rays will not enter into the active area of the detector, then intensity will go down like this. And if you come back again to the zero position, then we have again I0 direct beam. And if you go to the negative side, then you will have this type of curve. It is Gaussian-like curve okay it must be of course symmetric i cannot drawing very well uh, on the screen so it will be it, it it must it must be like this but sometimes sometimes for example if detector is staying like this so what do you see detector is a little bit shifted to the negative side then the direct intensity will also shift to the negative side let me draw it Two theta again, now you have this type of signal. Okay, this is the direct intensity. So if detector is staying at that position, a little bit up, okay, in, in positive direction, then you can see such signal. This is the intensity, this is the two theta again, now you have 
such signal, this is the I0 maximum intensity. Okay, so, but the best position for the detector is this one. Detector should stay exactly at the zero angle, okay? And we should see direct intensity at the detector. This is the first step of the alignment. Then let's continue with the second one. So half intensity, what is the meaning of half intensity? Then go again into the whiteboard, then produce a second page here. So half intensity, second step. Half intensity, direct beam was this one, half intensity is this one. Half intensity. You find the correct position for the detector. And here we have an X-ray source, an X-ray beam produced by the X-ray source directly goes to the detector, okay? And you can see full intensity, direct beam at the detector, okay? So then let's consider that you have a sample and you move that sample in. If you completely cut the X-ray beam, then the intensity will be like this. Again, X-ray source. And here we have sample. And nothing can go to detector. The intensity at the detector is zero, right? So half intensity is that X-ray source. Here you have detector and here we have our sample. So what do you see here that at the beginning it still was like this and then we cut the half of the intensity. Now we have half intensity. So this is the half intensity, but this is not enough. Okay, so we need something else. We should continue to the um, alignment. So what is the next step? The next step is sample scan, this third one, okay? The sample scan. So what is sample scan? Let's continue with the sample scan. So you can say theta scan, okay? So here, what do you see? This is the surface of the sample and this is the X-ray beam. And by eye, you cannot judge that they are parallel or not, but in reality, the surface of the sample must be parallel to the beam, okay? Sometimes it is staying like this. This is the X-ray source. This is the detector. And here, you have your sample. Sample is staying like this. Again, we cut the half intensity, okay? So here we have I0, but detector reads half intensity, okay? But what do you see here that the surface of the sample is not parallel to the X-ray beam. So it must be parallel before you start your experiment. So in order to make it parallel, you have to move the sample in that direction or in opposite direction, okay? We have to carry out theta scan. If you carry out an experiment in that condition, this is the theta sample, and this is the intensity, you will get such curve. So then it means that this sample is not parallel to the beam. In order to make exactly parallel to beam, 
first of all, for example, here you 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 read that this is one point two degrees, something like this. You say move theta in the instrument to one point two degrees, and then set theta angle to zero. So normally detector should, st uh, the sample should stay at that position in order to make parallel sample surface to the X-ray beam. Then um, now we have second situation after this one. X-ray source and This is the detector. And now the sample is staying like this. At the beginning, there, there is some certain angle between sample surface and X-ray beam. And after this theta scan, I move the, the sample to 1.2, for example. And then I said that this is zero. I mean, at that condition, at that condition, the sample surface is parallel to the X-ray beam. But what we see here that if you make this correction, sample surface becomes parallel to the beam. But what about the intensity? Here we produce intensity I zero, and all of the intensity goes to the detector. Here we have I zero, but here we need half intensity. So then after that process, we have to move again sample into the beam, okay? In order to get half intensity at the detector. So again, we are doing um, half intensity here. This is the intensity. This is the Z position of the um, sample. And at the beginning we read I zero, let's say, and we need half intensity. So let's consider this is time. You are recording the intensity and moving that one into the beam. So it will be like this. At the beginning, we see direct beam. Whenever you move the sample into the beam, it cuts the intensity. And when you see the half intensity, you stop and then we have half intensity. Now the sample cuts the half of the beam. Then we have half intensity. So after that process, again, repeat the theta scan, okay? Then look for another um, measurement here, like this one. So now, if you have exactly the correct position for the sample, if the maximum is staying at zero, I mean, if the half intensity is staying at zero, then it means that you have half intensity at the detector and the sample cuts half of the beam. This was the third one. And now, um, what about the uh, fourth one? Again, we are looking for the half intensity. We have done it, but it is not enough. So we have to go to higher angles. Let me choose another page here. We have to go to higher angles. So now we have that condition. We have found the half intensity. Detector is staying proper position. Okay, sample is staying proper position. We see half intensity at the detector and the sample surface and X-ray beam are parallel to each other. So we are at perfect condition. But there may be a, a still misalignment between the surface of the sample and X-ray beam in order to to correct this one, 
uh, we have to go to a little bit higher angles. So we are doing like this. X-ray source is staying again like this. And now the sample is staying like this. And now X-ray beam comes with some certain theta angle and reflected with same theta or two theta angle. Okay, this is the detector angle, two theta. So again, here we are repeating the sample scan, theta scan. So let's consider that here, theta, this incoming X-ray, the angle between the X-ray beam and sam sample surface is, let's say, two degrees, okay, and two theta is four degrees, and I am doing a theta scan at that condition. This is the theta, this is the intensity, and this is two degrees, okay, because the detector is staying at two degrees. Then I move it to that side, let's say um, three, four, and to that side, one, zero, okay? So if the position of the sample is perfect, then you should see such signal like this. So the detector is staying exactly at two degrees, but sometimes it happens like this. The maximum position of the pick slightly shifts to the right side or sometimes it shifts to the left side like this okay so then again you have to move this one to the left and you have to move this one to the right okay so then you have to ensure that perfect condition. So the sample is staying exactly at two degrees. So after that final step, your alignment is ready. So these are the alignment steps explained here. And here now we have, let's see the animation again. Okay, now it will be, um, it will be more meaningful for you okay after all these explanations so let's have a look alignment at the beginning beam is out and then we are looking for the detector position now beam is in we are looking for the half intensity and theta scan okay again half intensity and theta scan again and another angle, you go to higher angles, theta scan again. And here we will make another scan, you can say chi scan. You would like to make the sample surface ideally perfectly parallel to the X-ray beam, then your alignment is finished. So I have spent a lot of time for the alignment. Do you know why? Without alignment, your measurement is meaningless in X-ray diffraction, in X-ray reflectivity experiments. If you don't have good alignment, your measurements are meaningless, okay? It is not necessary to continue if you don't have alignment. So now let's continue with the real X-ray reflectivity data, what it tells us. Here you see a real X-ray reflectivity signal. This is two theta axis, I mean detector angle. And this is the intensity at the detector, okay? So if you start from zero or from very small angles to the 10 degrees, for example, you have this type of behavior of the intensity. What do you see that? There is a plateau here, okay? And then intensity decreases a lot at very low angles. And then it has this type of decrease by 
increasing two theta angle, okay? So it has general intensity behavior with two theta angle. So we have many features here, plateau here, sharp decrease in the intensity and oscillations, okay, many oscillations. So amplitude of the oscillations are changing. So there is a background signal, okay, at the end. So all these things tells us uh, lots of information about the sample under investigation. So the plateau here is affected by the sample size, roughness of the material, absorption, and also properties of the instrument, X-ray diffractometer. And critical angle here, what is this critical angle? So at the beginning, intensity is huge, okay? Maximum intensity. But at some critical angle, what happens? Intensity suddenly goes down, okay? Decreases a lot. This is called as critical angle. At this angle, X-rays start to enter into the material. I will go into detail in the next transparencies. So this is critical angle and it is associated with the density. It gives information about the density of the layers, density of the sample. And what have here, uh, we have oscillations and we have one peak here, another peak here, and the distance between the oscillations uh, gives us the thickness of the layers. We will go into detail. And here we have the amplitude of the oscillations. This amplitude gives us information about roughness, resolution, interface quality, and also changes in the densities between the layers. Um, and um, also the shape of the uh, signal gives us information about roughness and density. You can also tell like this, density and roughness affects the shape of the signal. And background signal is also associated with the instrument. So this is the reflectivity curve and these are the information which you can get from reflectivity measurements. So now let's try to analyze this behavior. What do you see here? Just consider that you have no feature here, or maybe let me draw. So what do you see here? Here we have a general behavior of the intensity. You increase the theta or two theta, and then intensity goes down with that behavior. Okay, so can we explain this behavior by using physics and mathematics? Yes, we can do that. Uh, Fresnel reflection can explain this behavior and I will um, try to explain this one. What do you see here? We have a material with some certain refractive index. We have already discussed this one in the previous lectures. Refractive index of the materials uh, is given by one minus delta minus I beta. This delta is responsible for the scattering mechanism here within the material and beta is responsible for the um, absorption mechanism. Actually, imaginary part is responsible for the absorptions. So um, X-rays is, X-rays are coming from the air, okay? And with some certain incident angle, and then they are reflected with some certain um, angle, okay? This incident angle and reflection angle are equal to each other for specular reflection. And this is the um, transmitted uh, X-ray beam and this is the transmission angle. In, in some books, in some papers, you can see um, such representation of the angles. Here we have surface normal and incident angle and reflection angle and transmission angle can also be shown the angle between X-ray beam and also surface normal. It doesn't matter, you can use both representation. And again, from our previous lectures, we know that delta is given by that expression. Here we have lambda, wavelength of the X-rays, electron, classical electron radius, and electron density of the material, okay, delta here. And beta contains absorption coefficient of the material and 
wavelength of the incoming X-rays. So what is electron density here? Electron density gives us total number of electrons within your material, okay? Um, what we have here, this N number of atoms per unit volume. So how many atoms do you have in unit volume? And each atom has Z electron, okay? We have N atoms in unit volume and each atom has a Z electrons. And this gives us the total electron density of uh, the system per unit volume, okay? So instead of N here, you can use Avogadro's number times density of material over atomic weight, okay? So just put it there and we will continue with that expression. We will use uh, Fresnel reflection um, equations and then we will try to calculate the behavior of intensity as a function of theta. So why this uh, sharp decrease is present here and why it decreases like this. Fresnel reflection will explain it. So for specular reflection, theta incident is equal to theta uh, re reflected. And then if you apply Sinas law, then N cosine theta incident is equal to N medium N sample times cosine theta transmission. Okay, this angle. N is this one. And here we have N, N is one for the air, okay? And put it there. And for the X-ray reflectivity measurements, we use hard X-rays, okay? We have discussed this one. If you are using hard X-rays, absorption is generally very small, okay? So the system is mainly dominated by the scattering mechanisms in, in, in hard X-ray experiments in X-ray diffraction, in X-ray reflectivity. So you can, you can omit this one, okay? Then N will be given by that expression, okay? So N A here is one, put one here, cosine theta incident is equal to N times cosine theta transmission. Put N here, okay, you have that expression. So um, let's consider that the incident angle is very, very small, then no X-ray can enter into the material. All of them are reflected from the surface of the sample for very small incident angles. This total external reflection can be present, okay? So this is called as total external reflection. So you send X-rays to the sample surface with very small incident angle, and they cannot enter into the material. All of them are reflected from the surface. This is total external reflection. It is uh, same as that you have a stone on your hand and you throw it this very small angle uh, to the surface of the lake, for example, okay? It cannot enter into the water. So then um, in that condition, what we see here, theta transmission, is zero because X-rays cannot enter into the material. Theta transmission, theta transmission is zero because this angle is very small and they are reflected from the surface. They, 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 uh, we have total external reflection. So theta transmission is zero. If here theta transmission is zero, then cosine zero is one, then this expression here, cosine theta transmission will be one, okay? So put that one here for that condition, cosine theta incident is equal to one minus delta, okay? And this special incident angle can be called as critical angle, and we can show it by theta critical. So cosine theta critical is equal to one, minus delta. Do you have any question until that part? Okay, then continue. So what I have told you that, this incident angle is very, very small. And for very small theta angles, I can write cosine theta by applying Taylor series. So 
for very small theta angles, cosine theta is given by one minus theta square over two, okay? So here we have theta critical, one minus theta critical square over two. So just take this one, put it there. Then I have one minus theta critical square over two is equal to one minus delta, okay? So negative will cancel this negative one will cancel this one here and then theta critical square will be equal to two delta okay so what is this delta the delta is responsible for the scatterings within that material and it is proportional to the electron density delta is proportional to the electron density so what i have found here critical angle is proportional to the delta, then delta is proportional to the electron density. Then I can say that critical angle is proportional to the electron density. Look at this one. Critical angle is proportional to the electron density. Okay, so we have um, got that relation between critical angle and electron density. I will go into detail later on. So now let's continue with Fresnel reflection. So for specular reflection again, theta incident is equal to theta reflected and here we have theta uh, transmission and Fresnel reflection coefficient is given by n times sinus theta incident minus n medium times sinus theta transmission over n times sinus theta incident plus n medium times sinus theta transmission. Okay, n air is one, put one here, okay. So we also know that according to the Snell's law, we have that relation n cosine theta is equal to n medium cosine theta transmission. What do you see here? Within that Fresnel reflection coefficient, we have theta transmission it is not so easy to measure the theta transmission, okay? I, I know the theta incident because I tell the program to go to the that angle to the goniometer and I know the theta uh, reflection because I know the position of the detector, but what about theta transmission? I cannot get information. I cannot get that information. It is um, hard to get it, okay? So then here, Within that equation, I would like to um, get rid of this theta transmission, okay? Instead of theta transmission, I would like to use something. So by using that Snell's law, I can get relation between theta incident and theta transmission. So just take theta transmission from that expression and put here and here. Then within that Fresnel reflection coefficient, we will only get, we will only have theta incident, which we know it. So then what we have here, sinus theta incident minus cosine square theta incident we have here, sinus theta incident and cosine theta incident. So theta incident, theta incident, theta incident, theta incident. So all this theta are known. Here we have n medium square, and we know that n is given by that expression. Take the square of that n, okay? Then you will able to find like this. Actually, there must be another term here with this one, okay? If you take the square of that, that expression, you have to get an additional term here, which is given by delta square, but since delta and beta are very, very small numbers, if you take the square of it, then you can also omit it, okay? So then instead of n square here, just take this one, put it there. Just take this one, put it there. Then um, we can get that expression. What we have here, here we have two delta, you see? Let's have a look, the previous transparencies. For two delta in the previous transparencies, we have found that relation. Two delta is equal to theta critical square. Just instead of two delta, put that one 
and then n square will be one minus theta critical square. Here we have n square, here we have n square. Instead of n square, just use that expression. Then Fresnel reflection coefficient will be like this. Just take this one and put it there. So then this r theta will be like this. Sinus theta incident minus Instead of n square, I will put this one, one minus theta critical square minus cosine square theta incident. And on the bottom side, sinus theta incident plus the same expression above. Instead of n square, I will use one minus theta critical square minus cosine square theta incident. What I have here, one minus cosine square theta incident. I know that expression, cosine square theta plus sinus square theta is equal to one. If I take, um, if I take that expression, sinus square theta is given by one minus cosine square theta. Here I have one minus cosine square theta, one minus cosine square theta. So instead of this one, just use sinus square theta. So then R theta will be like this. Sinus theta incident minus sinus square theta minus theta critical square sinus theta incident plus sinus square theta minus theta critical square. Then what I have told you that this angle is very small for very small angles, for very small incident angles, I can write that sinus theta is equal to theta, okay? for very small theta angles. Then instead of sinus theta, put theta. Instead of sinus theta, put theta. Instead of sinus square theta, put theta square. Here again, theta square, okay? So finally, Fresnel reflection coefficient expression can be written like this. Then what is reflection? Reflection, actually what you read at the detector, this is the intensity, okay? This is the incoming beam and this is the reflection. We read the detector, this is the intensity and which is given by um, multiplication of Fresnel reflection coefficient with its modulus, okay? And then you have that expression. I will not go into detail, you can do it by yourself. So what do you remember here that uh, we have omitted we have omitted absorption. Actually, this N contains um, also absorption, but we have omitted this one. If you also consider the absorption, okay, then this expression can be written in terms of absorption also, okay? This is the reflection produced by Fresnel reflection coefficient. So here we have theta, 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 okay? So instead of theta, we can use Q here within that expression. So Q is scattering vector is given by four pi over lambda times sinus theta, okay? Put, take the, um, for very small angles, instead of sinus theta, you can use theta. Then here we have theta, just replace all the theta here with Q. And instead of theta critical, just use Q critical. Okay, you can do that conversion. And finally, you have expression for the reflection. Okay, so what was our aim? Why we are doing all the things? Our aim to calculate the behavior of intensity as a function of angle. Intensity goes down as a function of angle, okay? This is the intensity or reflection 
and I would like to get an expression for the reflection as a function of theta. So what we have here, we have expression for the reflection as a function of Q or as a function of theta. Then this expression gives us the behavior of the X-ray reflectivity. So if you, um, if you apply the limit conditions for, for that equation, so this is the equation which we have calculated. It depends on Q or theta, it doesn't matter. So if you consider that Q is smaller than the Q critical, or you can consider like this, theta is smaller than theta critical. So here we have this signal. And here we have Q critical or theta critical, you can consider at that condition. So until that point, we have more or less a plateau, okay? Full intensity goes to detector. And at certain Q critical, intensity starts to go down, okay? So if the angle or Q is smaller than Q critical in that region, we have full intensity, R is one. Full intensity goes to detector. If Q is equal to Q critical or theta is equal to theta critical, put that condition, apply that condition within that equation, expression for the reflection. And then we will see that the reflectivity will decrease suddenly. We will have a sharp decrease in the reflectivity at that condition. And if Q is bigger than three Q critical, or if theta is bigger than uh, three, theta critical, then this expression will give us this result. What do you see here? The reflection, this is constant, okay, for certain material. And this is proportional to the, to the one over Q power four, or I can write it like this, one over theta power four. So it goes like this. So I have calculated the behavior of X-ray reflectivity as a function of theta or Q by using Fresnel reflection. Okay, now let's continue with the determination of the thickness in X-ray reflectivity experiments. If the critical angle is uh, if the incident angle is bigger than the critical angle, then X-rays can enter into the material. So then there will be reflection from the top and bottom surfaces of the films. Let me draw it like this. So here we have a sample. And here we have an X-ray beam. This is theta incident, and this is the detector here. Okay, the same theta angle. For very small incident angle, lower than the critical angle, all X-rays will be reflected from the surface no one can enter into the material. But whenever you increase the theta above the uh, theta critical, this X-rays will enter into the material, okay? And they will be reflected from the top surface and also down surface of the material. Like this, you can consider. So then, um, depending on the theta, this pass difference between the X-ray beam reflected from the surface and the X-ray beam reflected from the bottom surface, the pass difference 
uh, will be um, equal to n lambda or uh, or um, half lambda, something like this, then destructive and constructive interferences uh, will be occurred depending on the incoming theta angle. For this reason, in the reflectivity curve, we will see these oscillations up and down, okay? So cons constructive interference, destructive interference, constructive interference, destructive interference. So depending on the theta, past difference will be equal to n lambda or in, in other intermediate uh, numbers. So then Kissick fringes are um, produced. These are the Kissick fringes oscillations in the reflectivity curve. So how to calculate the thickness of the material. If you have just one single layer film here. So here we have intensity scale. Here we have two theta scale. We have one peak here, another peak here. This is the delta. Actually, this uh, let me let me delete this one. This is delta two theta between two peaks, or you can also take delta two theta from that points. Okay, then from that information, you can also get delta theta. Okay, and then you can get sinus delta theta. We know the Bragg's law and lambda to the sinus theta. Instead of sinus theta, just take this one, put it there and use one here, then take the D. D is the thickness of the film. Okay, then you can calculate thickness of the film by using the um, delta two theta or delta theta between the peaks or between that positions. So this is the wavelength of the X-ray and this is the position of that peak. And this is the position of that peak. Actually, this is delta theta, okay? So why we don't have here sinus theta? Let me also discuss this one. So actually, Bragg's law is given by n lambda to the sinus theta. If I take d from that expression, d will be like this. Lambda over 2 sinus theta, right? But why we don't have sinus theta here? We have just delta theta. Because this... Um, delta theta is very small, then for very small angles, sinus delta theta goes to delta theta. Okay, then I can use it like this. So then I can calculate thickness of the film, but it is just for a single layer. If you are talking about a multi-layer system, then the situation becomes very complicated and it is not so easy to um, get the information of each layer in multi-layer systems by using that method. And in that case, we have to use Parat formalism and the computer-based programs, um, commercial or um, homemade programs based on the Parat formalism. So if you have a multi-layer um, film here, okay, so we have n number of layers. So by using the Parrot formalism and by using the uh, commercial programs based on the Parrot formalism, you can get the um, thickness of each layer by fitting or simulating the X-ray reflectivity curve. So this is the thickness determination from the X-ray reflectivity measurements. So what is the effect of the thickness on the X-ray reflectivity signal? Here we have uh, two, um, two X-ray reflectivity measurements and they belong to different films. Now I will try to give you information about this. So let's start with the blue one. 
what is blue one here we have thickness of gold you see the thickness of gold is One hundred twenty angstrom, and the roughness of the gold. Here we have the roughness. Two angstrom, okay, and we have another film. Then this has thickness of forty angstrom. For the angstrom now and the roughness is same they have same roughness both of them are gold same material electron density is same but they have different thicknesses so what about the x-ray reflectivity curve what do you see here that the thicker gold film has higher intensity okay and in addition to that, the distance between the oscillations is less compared to the thinner film. So why we have it? Because just remember the Bragg's law and lambda to the sinus theta. What we have here, the delta theta here, and here we have another delta theta. So this delta is smaller. If you have smaller delta theta, then you have bigger thickness, okay? So bigger thickness gives us smaller delta theta. Then we have uh, many oscillations compared to that one within the same range. So what about the intensity here for the thicker film? We have more intensity compared to the thinner film. So it is acceptable because in thicker film we have many atomic layers okay compared to that one here let's say we have one atomic layer and here we have three atomic layers okay because the thickness of this one is three times uh, bigger than this this one so um, this since we have many layers here and each layer will send the x-ray uh, to the detector, okay? So we will read much more intensity from that thicker film. This is the film thickness effect on the X-ray reflectivity curves. So what about the electron density? So we have already shown that the critical angle is proportional to the two delta, and delta is also proportional to the electron density. Then critical angle is proportional to the electron density. We have already discussed this, right? Then let's have a look. What is the effect of the electron density on the X-ray reflectivity curves? So this is the two theta or Q axis. This is the reflectivity intensity. Here we have two films. One is with red one. Thickness is four angstrom and roughness is two angstrom, two angstrom roughness. And here we have roughness of silicon. It is grown on silicon. And here the roughness of the silicon at the interface is also uh, zero and we have another uh, this is gold okay this is gold we have another film shown by the blue color here it is aluminum different material it is grown on the silicon and roughness of the silicon is zero. Same with that one. And what about the roughness of the aluminum? Roughness of the aluminum is also 
two angstrom, same with that one. And what about the thickness of the aluminum? Thickness of the aluminum is also 40 angstrom. They have same thickness, they have same roughness, they have same substrate roughness. So everything is same, but this is aluminum, this is gold. So if you remember the periodic table, gold is much bigger atom compared to the aluminum. So electron density of aluminum, so electron density of gold is much bigger than the electron density of aluminum, okay? So this is the only difference here. What do you see here? For gold, you have much bigger intensity and much bigger critical critical angle. So let's consider that this is the uh, th this is the critical angle somewhere here, and this is the critical angle for aluminum. So critical angle for gold is much bigger, since the electron density of gold is bigger than the electron density of aluminum. So you can consider like this: critical angle for gold is bigger than critical angle for aluminum. It is acceptable because critical angle is proportional to the uh, electron density. So what do you see here that, okay, critical angle is bigger for gold, for the red one, but what about the intensity? What we see here that this gold with higher electron density produces much more intensity at the detector, okay? So intensity is much higher compared to the aluminum. It is also acceptable because within uh, gold, there are many electrons and each electron uh, scatters the X-rays and send the X-rays to the detector. But since we have less electrons in aluminum, even if the thickness is same, but the electron uh, density of the gold is much bigger, then gold contains more electrons compared to the aluminum then the intensity at the detector is much bigger for the gold. Now let's continue with the roughness. Here we have reflection from rough surface. Here we have reflection from flat surface. So just consider that here we have a flat surface. Flat surface means that we have perfect arrangement of the atoms, perfect arrangement of the atomic layers, okay? Then when you send x-rays to the material, they are reflected very well to the detector. This is flat surface. If you have rough surface, then you have this kind of surface we can consider. What do you see here that the surface of the material is, not, is like this, not flat. Here we have very flat surface, but here the surface is very rough and you send X-ray it goes like this. Okay. Many of the X-rays absorbed on the surface or scattered elsewhere. So few of them goes to detector if the surface is rough. But in case of flat surfaces, all X-rays more or less goes to detector, okay? So then you can expect that the intensity at the detector for the rough surfaces will be less than the flat surfaces, okay? And this is given by that expression. Let me clear it. This is the um, reflection from the flat surface. This is the reflection from the rough surface. And this uh, reflection decreases by the term. Here we have minus E over minus Q square times sigma square over half. What is this Q? Q is angle. T 
theta or q, okay? So, um, I mean, instead of q, you can use that expression, okay? So, theta and q is proportional to the theta, theta is proportional to the q, so this is theta or q. And here we have a sigma. Sigma is the roughness of the material. If you have roughness, okay, then this term decreases that signal. At the beginning, you have good intensity from the flat surface, but if you have roughness, then the intensity goes at the detector here. So what do you see here? The effect of the roughness increases as a function of the as a function of the Q or as a function of the angle. At higher angles, I mean if you increase the income, if you increase the incoming angle here, this is the theta. If you increase it a little bit more, then this term will increase here, then this will decrease more. Okay? So at higher angles, the effect of the roughness will be very dominant, okay, very visible. We will see some examples for that. Look at this one. Here we have gold, here we have gold. Thickness of the gold is 40 angstrom, thickness of the gold is 40 angstrom, and roughness of the um, blue one is six angstrom. This is gold. Thickness is 40 angstrom. Roughness is six angstrom. And now let's continue with the blue one. Sorry, red one. Again, it is also gold. Thickness is again same, but what about the roughness? Roughness is around two angstrom. Okay, thickness is same. So what about the result? Since the electron density of this one and electron density of this one are same because we are talking about same material, they are gold. Since the number of the atomic layers are same, okay, so the critical angle is same intensity is more or less same. What, what do you see here that for the uh, better surface, for the flat surface, for the red one, we have much clear oscillations, you see. But for the blue one, look at the blue one. We have the same thickness and the position of the pigs and position of that positions are same, but the amplitude decreases a lot for the blue one due to that expression, okay? And this decrease in the amplitude becomes very dominant at high angles, at high Q values. So what about the effect of the substrate roughness? So again, here we have two gold films. They have uh, same thickness. They have same roughness, but uh, the substrate roughness is different for each material. So let me draw. Here I have gold film grown on silicon substrate. And for the upper case, at the interface, there is no roughness. And for the lower case, same gold material with same thickness, grown on same silicon substrate, but here we have roughness of silicon one angstrom. So what about the effect of the roughness? So what do you see here? Thickness is same, roughness is same, electron density is same because we are talking about gold and gold here. So critical angle will be same. So the position of the peaks, position of the oscillations will be same. Amplitude of the oscillations will be same. But what you see here at higher angles, this red curve intensity 
goes down faster than the blue one at higher angles. You see, because the red one has higher roughness at the interface between substrate and gold. But what, why, why this intensity difference between blue one and red one becomes dominant at higher angles because at higher angles, X-rays start to enter into the substrate very much, okay? And depending on the angle, this term becomes more dominant here, okay? Q, higher angles. At higher angles, the effect of the roughness will be very dominant and the intensity will go down. With that one, I finished my lecture. If you have any question, then let me know. Okay, then. See you.